there are people here now, people watching right now, that there's something that happens when we start singing songs during worship. And that something is that you feel a disconnect. What's going on here right now? I should be this, I should be that, I'm a Christian, what's going on, I don't know. And I wanna encourage you, those are powerful lyrics, but that's what they are, just lyrics. The only reason they're true is because they're about the God of the heavens and the earth that is over all, that is perfect over all, that rules over all perfectly, and that's in the Bible. So you see, the Bible validates what we sing up here. The Bible is why we praise during the music time of worship. You see, worship is not what we just did. That's part of worship. This is just music worship to our Father in heaven. So you see, there are so many other ways to worship our God for everything he is and everything he has done that we freely received. And just one way is that despite however chaotic your life is or whatever situation you're in, or maybe you're not a believer in Jesus Christ yet, but you're here, we're glad you're here, but maybe the worship is not when the music is over. The worship doesn't end when the music's over. It's just one way. It's one way to express to the one true God over the heavens and the earth that regardless of what's going on in my life, regardless of where my faith is at right now, because Christian, let's be real, it's peaks and valleys. It's not always up here on cloud nine, and it's not always here down in the ditch. It's peaks and valleys, our faith. And no matter where we are in our faith, the one thing that remains true is that our God is no failure. No failure at all. And I don't say this yet. It's for him, not for me. So the only reason I'm confident in saying this is because when you read this scripture, you will see time and time and time again that our God is victorious. Our God is victorious. Always. Always. We read about how he parted the Red Sea and took care of his people and kept them safe. He was victorious. We read about how he led his, his, his church, his, his nation into the promised land and all the things in between then and, and, and the garden that happened and he was victorious. He is victorious. We read about how the disciples were in a boat with Jesus. Jesus is snoozing down under in the boat, okay, sleeping and there's a storm raging. And all of the disciples are freaked out. Then they're, they're so freaked out, they don't know what to do. These waves, this boat, Jesus is sleeping. Wake up, wake up, there's a storm. And he looks at their faith. And that's what he comes at. Not their fear. He says, lack of faith. And what does he do? He speaks to a storm that no man on earth has ever been able to speak to. And it's calm. So you come here just as you are, because that's how, what we're supposed to do. Chaotic life, chaotic situation, faith somewhere between the peaks and the valleys. And what you need to know is that we look at the, these miracles in the Bible, we look at his faithfulness and the powerful things that he does that are inexplainable. And that's right here. And we focus on all this. And we say, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. But we need to take 10 steps backwards and look at what the situation was before that happened. Because it wasn't so beautiful. It wasn't. Jesus and, and the disciples, their friend was beheaded. They get in a boat to go to the other side of the lake to just be by themselves, mourn, because their friend was just murdered. They show up on the other side of this lake, boom, there's masses of people. But we focus on what Jesus did after that, and he preached to them. And he shared the truth with them. But 10 steps backwards, when we look at what the disciples did, we look at that loss, we look at that grief, we look at that unexpected nature of what happened. And I gotta, I mean, they're no more perfect than I am, no more imperfect than I am, and I'd be wrecked to tell you the God honest truth. But they follow Jesus into this boat, like, thank God, we're finally going to get rest. This guy's been going hard. We need to break Jesus. And the first things out of Jesus' mouth is that he saw the masses of people like sheep. He had compassion on them. 
like sheep without a shepherd. So what drove Jesus to do that? The compassion he sees in those people that came to hear from him. So I want to encourage you. All of the miracles in the Bible are totally true. They all happened. But there's a story right before those happened. And when we understand that story or we look at that story that happened before the miracles, oh, then we sing songs like this. And you're not singing them because they're lyrics. You're singing them because we know our God is victorious. We know that even though I am a failure at times and I am nothing without Jesus, he is always victorious. Always. So, my notes are right here. <laughs> Lots of points. Get ready. So let's start with scripture here. If you'd like to stand, we're going to read the, the passage of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Starting at verse 25. So open up your phone, your Bible. You know, if you're watching online, flip over you know, to another tab and open up another window uh, for the Bible. Or uh, open up your Bible, read along. So starting at verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, him being Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, The lawyer answers. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, says to Jesus, well, and who is my neighbor? And how many times in your life have you been in a chaotic situation and you've sought an answer? You pray about it, you seek people, you know, you seek God, and he doesn't give you an answer. And he doesn't answer a question with a question, but he answers a question with a story. <laughs> I mean, it's just awesome how he works. So this is a story that, that Jesus has for the lawyer. Who is my neighbor? Jesus replies, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers and, uh, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed, uh, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound his wounds, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sat him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took, uh, took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when you come back. Which of these do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell above the, uh, among the robbers, he said? Uh, well, he said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So join me in prayer here. Heavenly Father, Oh, we need you. We need you right now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you, uh, simply that you reveal Jesus to us right now through this message, through this time, that we would come in one way and we would leave transformed by your power, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we, I, I ask for fertile ground in all those that are, are here in the building and watching online, that they would receive your word, that you, Holy Spirit, would meet them where they're at, Jesus, that you would transform and change them and deepen their faith. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, or if you'd like to remain standing with me, that's cool too. <laughs> uh, I'll just note, nobody took me up on that. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I've, I've read this parable, I've heard it preached about, I've you know, thought about things, and I've got to be honest, I've always looked at it a little bit wrong, a little bit wrong. I've often looked, you know, well, I would never be like that, Laura. I would never, if I were in Jesus' time, I would never question him. I would just believe what he says. You know, if I saw someone that needed help, I would do something. You know, so I'd look at this and say, well, you know, that's great. The Samaritan's pretty cool. I hope I could be a Samaritan one day and, you know, help somebody and, you know, be all that and, you know, move on and, and that'll build my faith. I used, to, I used to look at it like this. And, you know, as, as a Holy Spirit kind of, revealed things to, to me through this scripture, it became more and more of a reminder that, that I've been each and every one of those except one. And if we're, if we're real with ourselves, 
Christian, you would agree about that for yourself. That at one point in my life, I was like that lawyer questioning, what do I have to do to get eternal life? What do I have to do in order to get? I want to get something from God. I need to get his patience. I need to get his healing. I need to get his release. I need to get his freedom. I need to get more of him. So the question, naturally, to a nuts and bolts kind of mindset is, well, what do I have to do? How do I do this? I was that lawyer once, and sometimes still am, and i got to stop myself by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit to say, it's not about what I do in order to get. So in Christian world, we call that works righteousness. And friend, there is nothing that I can do to, by myself, to inherit eternal life. Nothing. I wasn't built to do that. God didn't create me to be my own good person so that I get eternal life with him. So I used to be that lawyer. And then I used to niffle gnaw. Uh, well, who actually is my neighbor? Because there's some people I don't like, and I hope they're not considered my neighbor. What do you say, God? You got my back? I was that person also. And again, you don't do anything for eternal life. You don't do anything to freely receive what's been freely given. Well, you, if there's any doing to be done... It's receiving. It's receiving. Like this. Here's a pen. And you would receive the pen. That's the only doing. There's no amount of praying. There's no amount of good deeds. There's no amount of serving God. There's no amount of holy, holy things as a mask over ourselves so that there would now be eternal life. None at all. The only act that's necessary for eternal life is something that I was never built for, that you were never built for. So this responsibility for eternal life is not on your shoulders. It's on the shoulders of a man that left his place on high, came here to earth as a baby, lived a life we could never live, received a punishment that I deserve, that you deserve, and is victorious over life and death, and his name is Jesus. And that is what we receive. If, if there's any doing to be done to receive, to, to inherit the kingdom of God, that's what the scripture says, to freely receive what, what's been given. And what's been given to everybody here and online is the opportunity to receive Jesus. You see, so, your responsibility now for eternal life, not on your shoulders. It isn't. No amount of scripture memorizing, good personism is going to help you receive eternal life. The only thing ever for always is receiving the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the other part, this self-righteous part, ooh, that's juicy. That's juicy. That's when the lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? Trying to, you know, How righteous am I? Come on, get my back, Jesus, in this answer. I'm a lawyer, I'm righteous, and I've been doing some of these things. You asked me for the answer, I gave you the answer. You said I was right, I've been doing it. So tell me, oh Jesus, how righteous I am in my actions. And what's his answer? A story. A story. You see, self-righteousness, self-righteous deeds, things that we do to make ourselves feel better or we think we do that make us more righteous before our God in heaven, that's called self-righteous. That does not equate to faith in Jesus Christ. So, the answer is a juicy one. He tells a story. You should have gotten milk and cookies at the door. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> story time. Get it? Yeah. I have five kids, so we go through cookies and milk and story time. All that. So, anyways. Uh, so the answer is this parable. And it's so interesting. And I looked at this and I said, Well, God, who am I in this story? Who am I in this story? You didn't just tell us a story so we'd be like, you know, fist bump and have a good day. 
You know, he told us this story for a reason. Who am I in this story? Because who I've been <laughs> is not who I thought I was in the story. You see, the answer that Jesus gives is an answer that was unexpected, but is true. And I look at this and I say, okay, well, God, you've, you've shown to me who I am in this story. But Jesus, where are you in this story? Besides the storyteller, obviously you're telling us this story, but who are you in this, in this parable, Jesus? Why are you telling me this? Why are you telling me and us this? Why are you telling the people of that time and religious leaders and a lawyer this story? Who are you, Jesus? And who he is, is the truer, perfect, holy, flawless Samaritan in this story. What does the Samaritan do? He sees a half-dead human, robbed, stripped, beaten, has compassion on him. You see, and, and I ask myself, who am I? Because I, I know I've been the person that sees that half-dead person and walks around. I don't have time for that. I can't. I don't have anything to offer him. I can't. I've been that person, and I'm not proud of it. And I know there are some here that have been that person who have also been the Levite too that said, whoa, that's, that's death. Um, no, I don't have anything for that. I've been that person. But the core is not about how much of a good Samaritan you think you are or you think you can be a good person in those situations or have the right compassion for those situations. It does not rely in yourself. You see, the true core of this is to know that we are the ones that were beaten, robbed, and left half dead on the side of the road. We were, all of us. Christians, that, that's what we believe. Well, what is the death? I've never been beaten, robbed, and left on the side of the road. I live in America. That's never happened to me. I live here. That's never happened to me. Or it has, or it hasn't. I don't know. But let's look back where the Bible starts. God creates the heaven and the earth. He creates man. And where does he put man and woman? Puts them in the garden. Where's God? In the garden. See, God did not create us so that we'd have a chaotic life and eventually sometime return to him and he can reign on high forever and ever. He created us originally to always be with him with no obstacle, with no deterrent, with nothing between him and us living our lives with the creator of the heavens and the earth. And you see, what makes us robbed and beaten and naked and half dead on the side of the road is sin. Our, my sin makes me the half-dead person on the side of the road, makes you the half-dead person on the side of the road. My sin looks different than yours. Yours looks different than mine. So church, is about time we get over what the sin looks like and look at what the sin does and be more concerned about the eternal impact of that. Maybe that's the breakthrough. Maybe that's the breakthrough in your life and your faith. Maybe that's the breakthrough in worship. That is not about the song, it's not about the band, it's about our God that reigns supreme on high and is always victorious. Maybe it's about him instead of the beat of the song. So this Samaritan and this half-dead person is a picture of what sin does to us. Literally, wrecks your life. It wrecks the original intention of life and why we were created. It also shows us a picture of who Jesus is. That you don't have to get over your anxiety before you come to Jesus. You don't have to be a super patient person and be so compassionate before you come to Jesus. You don't have to stop being self-righteous and greedy before you come to Jesus. You don't have to be you know, sober mind and, and body and whatever before you come to Jesus because this shows us we are all half dead on the side of the road. And Jesus, the true perfect one over all forever, is the only one that stops and picks up. And what's the first thing he does? Shame on you. No. He bounds up your wounds, takes care of what happened to you, and he puts you on a road to recovery 
where you have a place to recover. And Christian, we call that church. The church, not church. His people. His people that he saved, that he's brought back now. We were dead, not with God in our sin. And he takes care of our owies. <laughs> he puts us on a donkey, he puts us on an animal, goes to the innkeeper. Take care of this guy, take care of this girl. So who are you in this story? Sometimes I've been the lawyer. Sometimes I've been the innkeeper. What does that mean? Having to trust someone before you see it happen. Sometimes I've been, you know, the priest. I, show, I shared that with you. It's not about who you are in this story. It's about what's been done with you, for you and is depicted in this story. So Jesus, this good Samaritan is a picture of Jesus. Jesus is more holy than this Samaritan. Jesus is more perfect. Jesus is perfect. There's nothing else that needs to be said about him. He is the one that cleans up your past. That's taking care of your wounds. Forgiven. Forgiven. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Done. He takes you to an end. He takes care of you so you have a place to heal, a place to thrive, a place to be, not a better you because you're so good and you brought yourself to this place, but he brings you to a place where you can now become what he's always wanted you to be, what he designed you for, what he designed me for. That's the church, the inn, the innkeeper. All you Christians here, we're all innkeepers, taking care of the battered from sin, not looking at, you must have done something to get this, knowing that I too, <laughs> I'm a half-dead man on the side of the road needing Jesus. So he provides for our current, Jesus does, and he covers our future. He covers it. That's what the Samaritan did. Here's two denarii, here's two wages, take care of him. If you need more, I'll cover it. Jesus doesn't just forgive you here, all of your past, so you can feel better and have a better life here on earth. And he doesn't just do that and then put you in a home well, in his church or in small groups or here in up, uh, prayer with, with his church, a place to, to receive healing and reconciliation so that you could feel better about yourself. You see, he does all these things out of love, out of compassion, out of compassion. And they're eternal. They're eternal. So, I've been the half-dead person. I've been the priest. The one person I've never been is the Good Samaritan. Never. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I don't know. But the hardest part about reading this is the last words of Jesus in this parable. You go and do likewise. Hmm. Well, I've never been the Good Samaritan. How do I do this? I have no clue. I don't know my head from a hole in the ground when it comes to being a Good Samaritan. I don't. But you see, again, the purpose of this parable is not to point to us and say, what do you have in you in order to get from God? It's not it. The point of this is to say we are all like that half-dead person on the side of the road, because sin has robbed the life that God created us to have with him. Every single one of us. So this story is to look not to ourselves intrinsically and say, I must go do this now because I'm great. We must look to Jesus. We must rely on his Holy Spirit that if we sing a song about how he's never a failure, that's why we don't put our faith in songs we sing. That's why we look to the Bible and say, you're victorious, always. There's no question about it. I don't remember seeing any scripture in here where bad things happen to his nation and his people because of God. 
I see and hear like the disciples in the boat scared out of their mind in a storm and their lack of faith is what Jesus addresses. Not how bad they are for being scared in a boat. And then we look at the miracle of how God just speaks whatever he spoke to wherever he spoke it. And the storm immediately stops and the waters are gentle and all the disciples are like, oh, thank God. This is so good. And then Jesus says, Where's your faith? Where's your faith? So we look at this miracle. God spoke to a storm and it stopped. Let's look back in the story and see what happens. And as we inch closer by the grace of God, understanding more and more of the story as the, his Holy Spirit reveals it to us, you see now we're at a pivotal point. We are at a pivotal point here, miracle, me. Follow me? Miracle, me. Okay? If I'm over here and God does a miracle despite my faith and the only thing he comes at is my faith, what do you think my next step is right here? Something to do with faith. Something to do with believing what is not right in front of your face. Like Moses and the Israelites going through the Red Sea. What was in front of their face? A big body of water. What did God do? Parts the way, dry ground. Wow! Disciples, storm. No storm. What should have been applied? We have faith in you, Jesus. Instead of being fearful because of what's in front of our face, we trust you because you're with us. And even if you're not with us, we know that because of your finished work, we're good. We're good. You see, Jesus sends out 72 disciples, 72 people, okay? These people, I don't know much about this, but I, I have to believe he would send people out that listen to his teachings. Yeah? I mean, I would have to believe that. So these 72 people, he says, go. Go out here, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Go do all that stuff to people that listen to him. And they come back. And what do they say? Oh, God, holy cow, it happened. Just like you said it. Demons came out. And people were, were sick, and now they weren't. And they, they didn't have it all together, and now you did something magical or, or mysterious or, or mir miraculous in their life. Oh, isn't it time that we stop being surprised when God moves? Because what does he address to them? Don't you worry about all that stuff. You just rejoice that your name is written in the eternal book of life. So you see, where I'm at with this, parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus is the only true, perfect, good ever. And he found you the same way he found me beat up by sin. And he did the same thing to me that he's done to you, Christian. And he will do the same thing to you when you come to faith in him that he's done to me. And he picks you up and he forgives your past. He provides for you now and he builds an eternal home in heaven so that we can always be with him. And he never, ever fails ever 